Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's special online event, FDA Modern Modernization and the Winding Down of Animal Testing and Drug Development. I'm Joseph Grove, host of the Animal Wellness Podcast, and I'll be your host and moderator this evening. I'll introduce our panelists in a moment, but first, a few quick notes. First, this event is brought to you by Animal Wellness Action and the Center for a Humane Economy. By registering, you have joined our ranks. You're on the team. Welcome. And we hope you'll enjoy the content we'll be sending you from time to time and that you'll take advantage of its ability to connect you to your legislators and other officials to make your voice for animals heard. Second, we've set aside some time at the end of the event to ask questions. You'll doubtless have some. This is a complex subject. We'll share it. And if you have anything about which you would like to know more, put it into the question box at the bottom and we'll try to get to it at the end of the event. You should see that in your Zoom window. It's called QA or question. Enter them there and we'll get to them as best we can. Tomorrow, everyone who registered will receive a link to the recording of this webinar, as well as any assets that may be mentioned throughout it. We invite you to share that information with anyone who may have a similar heart for animals, specifically animal testing. All right, thanks for your patience for all of that. Let me introduce our speakers and be patient with me here. When I introduce myself, it's, it's Joe. I have a high school diploma shop, uh, but, but these guys have a few more credentials. We're joined tonight by Wayne Paselli, the founder and president of Animal Wellness Action and the Center for a Humane Economy. Before joining the animal wellness groups, Wayne was the president and CEO of the Humane Society of the United States, tripling the budget and nest assets of that organization. He founded the Humane Society Legislative Fund, and prior to that, he was executive director of the Fund for Animals. The nonprofit Times named him seven times as one of the nation's top 50 nonprofit executives, and in 2005, he was named Executive of the Year. He is the author of two New York Times bestselling books and has led efforts to pass 1,500 state laws for animals, more than 100 federal laws and amendments, 30 ballot initiatives, and 500 corporate agreements. He is a graduate of Yale University. Tammy Drake is our Director of Research and Regulatory Policy. Tammy coordinates research regarding regulatory testing methods for new product development, monitors agency rulemaking changes, and drafts guidance policies. She has co-authored three citizens' petitions to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration on behalf of the Center for Responsible Science requesting regulatory change to update decades old preclinical testing requirements to allow for and incentivize use of human relevant test methods. Finally, Dr. Zahir Nali is an interdisciplinary executive scientist. He served in senior positions at US medical foundations, including as chief scientific officer, vice president for research and chief executive officer. Earlier in his career, he served on the faculty at major research universities where he led scientific teams and published groundbreaking work in top journals like Nature. He is his awardee, excuse me, he is an awardee of the American Heart Association, the Department of Defense, the American Cancer Society Scholar Program, and the National Priorities Research Program. Dr. Nolly has a master's degree in public administration and a PhD in physiology and biophysics from the Stony Brook University Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Joint Programs. He was a pioneer in developing and manufacturing high throughput technologies like microarrays, and his doctoral work uncovered new mechanisms for viral oncoproteins and genomic, genomic instability, cellular toxicity, and cancer. See, I can't even say what this guy's smart at, let alone be smart at it. So thank you, panelists. We're glad you're with us. Welcome again to the guests. Uh, Mr. Baselli, let me turn it over to you. We're talking Thanks. about FDA modernization. Take it away, good sir. Great, Joseph. Thank you so much. And welcome to all of you. I'm so glad to be joined by uh, Tamara and Zahair uh, on this panel, and really most of all by each of you. I'm really excited about uh, tonight's uh, webinar about the FDA, about drug testing, you're going to be dazzled by uh, two videos we've got. We have two uh, remarkable statements, original statements. We just got them today uh, from Senator Cory Booker, a Democrat of New Jersey, and Senator Rand Paul, a Republican of Kentucky, 
whom we worked very closely with to pass the FDA Modernization Act 2.0. So this is really an all-star uh, lineup of folks uh, after uh, my uh, opening comments. So let me just give you a little bit of, of framing here and tell you um, a bit about our work. So Animal Wellness Action is a 501c4 organization. It conducts lobbying and political activities, really trying to influence the operations of government using the legal system to protect animals by establishing legal standards against animal cruelty. And we would work very hard to implement laws once they're passed and to enforce those laws. And again, a big, big category of animals are at risk in many different sectors of the economy and animals need protection under the law. The other big category of our work is, is zeroed in on by the Center for Humane Economy. And the Center for Humane Economy is a 51c3 organization, and that organization seeks to influence corporations, businesses, the biggest sectors of our economy, trying to change the way they think about animals and modifying purchasing practices, supply chains, research and development, and other operations. Because so many animals are touched by corporations. They're owned, if they're farm animals, they're used in testing by pharmaceuticals or used in fashion, all these different categories. So these two big levers, influencing government and business is really the work that we do at Animal Wellness Action and the Center for Humane Economy. And one of the really big issues is the use of animals in science and testing. It's not as big in raw numbers as factory farming, but it's one of the big categories with tens of millions of animals uh, used. And there are many different categories. Everyone really has heard about cosmetic testing on animals. And now, after years of campaigning by animal advocacy groups, you can go into a store and see that a cosmetic says not tested on animals. There are pesticide, uh, pesticides that are examined by scientists for environmental health issues. There are chemicals. There are a number of other categories of research and testing. But the biggest, and it's difficult to quantify, some people may say it's 75% of all animals used in testing, is for drug development. We're developing drugs for cancer or a heart medicine or a bone medicine or a pain medication. And all you have to do is watch the nightly news or watch television for a few minutes, and you'll see just the cascade of pharmaceutical companies uh, talking about drugs that they've produced and telling you that these are drugs that may address a, a medical problem that you have. Think about this fact that since the 1930s, since really 1938, under the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetics Act, there has been a mandate under federal law to use animals in tests for screening drugs for safety and for the effectiveness of the drug. So safety so that you don't get impaired or get killed by taking a drug that is unsafe. And the effectiveness piece is testing the drug to see if it works as promised. So for 85 or 86 years, we as a nation have been churning out drugs and doing long-term animal tests, years sometimes using primates, beagles and other dogs, rabbits, and a wide range of other species to do this safety screening and also this uh, testing for effectiveness or efficacy. And the data show that it doesn't typically work. And that after we test on animals and a drug passes muster in those animal tests, it then moves to human clinical trials with volunteers and it fails. It just simply, the, the animal test did not forecast the outcome or the reaction of those drugs in the human system. So then the drug developer, the pharmaceutical company, the university has to start all over again. This has been a colossal waste of money. It has delayed the development of life-saving cures. It delays the delivery of drugs that work to one degree or another. And overarching all of this is that adverse reactions to drugs are the fourth largest cause of death in the United States. This is a broken system. 
And we at Animal Wellness Action and the Center for Humane Economy work to do something about it. My colleague, Tammy, Tammy Drake, whom you'll hear from tonight, and one of her uh, colleagues, Alexandra Paul, along with Dr. Gary Michelson, presented to me information that I've relayed to you and other details and said, we have a mandate for animal testing for new drugs. We've got to, we've got to solve this problem. We've got to address this issue. Because non-animal testing methods, 21st century science built on human biology can be much more effective. But we're really preventing the Food and Drug Administration from using those with this statutory language from the Depression era saying we must use primates and beagles and other animals. So that landed us in this national debate. We worked to introduce legislation called the FDA Modernization Act in 2021. And by the end of 2022, we had passed the nation's most significant animal testing law ever. And that is the FDA Modernization Act 2.0. It was amended as it went through the legislative process. This happened in record time. This is the biggest bill that's ever been passed by the Congress on animal testing. And the first one was the 1966 Laboratory Animal Welfare Act, which didn't prevent anything, really just set up animal care standards, uh, but didn't really go to the heart of testing itself. We didn't ban animal testing for drug use uh, with the FDA Modernization Act 2.0, but what we did is we lifted the mandate to unleash innovation and human ingenuity to screen these drugs in a much more effective way without leaving an enormous trail of animal victims. And, you know, with these headlines you see about the FDA Modernization Act on your screen, you'll see Senator Paul uh, proposes that FDA take action on this issue. So Senator Rand Paul was the lead author of the Senate bill. He's from Kentucky. He's a conservative uh, Republican. He'd never really been involved in a major animal testing issue or animal advocacy issue, but he took this on partnering with Cory Booker. And I'm so excited that he has today done a video for us uh, for our webinar tonight on the FDA Modernization Act. So let me ask my colleagues to roll that video. I want to express my gratitude to all of you who supported and championed the FDA Modernization Act 2.0. Together, we have ushered in a new era of drug testing and approval. Your dedication to this cause has been instrumental in bringing about a transformation in the pharmaceutical industry. Our work on this legislation emphasized the importance of precision medicine and how needless animal testing can be in the approval process. We've made faster and safer approval of drugs, as well as improved patient access to innovative therapies paramount. Thanks to your support from groups like pharmaceutical companies and bipartisanship in Congress, this legislation passed and was signed into law by the president. Unfortunately, the FDA is dragging their feet on implementing this law. So what we need to do is put pressure on them to actually follow the law. Because of their unwillingness to act, I sent a letter to FDA Commissioner Robert Califf requesting not only information on steps the FDA is taking to update their unlawful regulations, but also a timeline for implementation. The FDA continues to mandate that investigational new drug applications include the results of animal toxicology studies, precisely what we were trying to make optional in our legislation. Our legislation said you no longer had to use animal studies, but that these would be optional. The FDA isn't following the letter of the law. The FDA Modernization Act's 2.0's regulatory changes are already law. They were signed by the president in 2022 and the FDA's sluggish bureaucratic deregulation process is unacceptable. So while we celebrate this legislation's game-changing shift towards faster approvals, safer and more effective drugs, and the reduction of animal testing, we must continue to push for full implementation and widespread adoption of these new methodologies. So I will continue doing everything I can in the Senate to get answers from the FDA, not just because it's a law, but because we are poised to revolutionize the pharmaceutical landscape. The industry is evolving and so are we as a society. Animal testing has, has been proven, agonizing for the animals and an obsolete practice. This bill not only means a more innovative drug approval process, but a more humane one as well. Thank you again for your unwavering support for the FDA Modernization Act 2.0. Together, we're paving the way for a safer, more efficient, 
and innovative future in drug testing and approval. You know, I'm just so uh, pleased to have worked so closely with Senator Paul uh, on this issue and with him as the lead author of the FDA Modernization Act. He's an MD. And I've seen him grow in terms of his sensibilities about animals, and he's just been a great partner. And right by his side and right by our side, Animal Wellness Action uh, and the Center for Humane Economy is Senator Cory Booker, who's been involved in animal advocacy since his first day in the United States Senate. Uh, he has been without question the leading champion for animal protection in the United States Senate working on farm animal welfare, animal testing, wildlife protection, you name it. He's been incredible. So it was the Paul Booker bill. Uh, and uh, we also have a statement that Senator Booker provided to us uh, today as well. Hey, it's Cory Booker, and I'm sorry I couldn't be with you for this webinar, but it's very important to me. And therefore, I wanted to share my enthusiasm for this issue and working together. The FDA Modernization Act 2.0 was a top priority for me in the 117th Congress. It was, I believe, a landmark achievement for both animals and for our public health, paving the way for 21st century human relevant science, reducing the awful use, unnecessary use of animals in science and delivering better, safer treatment and cures for patients in need. This legislation was a turning point in the debate over animal testing that showed not only the raw, naked truth that cruelty and the cruelty of animal testing, but clenched the debate on the unreliability of animal testing to forecast human response to drugs and vaccines. I'm upset that the FDA is not working to implement the law. This is unacceptable. I've sent a letter to the FDA Senator Paul and seven other senators making that demand that they fulfill their constitutional responsibility. I hope you will join me in that demand. I'm planning to introduce legislation again on this issue and I'm gonna need your help. But I want you to know we are on the right side of history. That issues of compassion and scientific truth, that they can reside not only side by side, but they are, in my opinion, one ideal that helps us as humanity to advance, not only to our virtues, but also to our health and safety. Thank you all for standing with me in this, and I wish you all the best. So you can see two reasons why we had success, because we have two great advocates in the United States Senate. We had great advocates in the House as well. And both senators spoke about FDA's sluggish behavior. We passed this law. It was just about unanimous if, as, as you measure progress in the House and Senate uh, because we were able to build such an immense coalition on this subject. But FDA has not rewritten its regulations and drug sponsors when presenting a new drug still are confused. They're wondering if the regulations that talk about the use of animals bind them to continue to use animals. So we're not done. I will tell you that it's frustrating to see that FDA is not acting in a way uh, that is really at the core of its responsibility as an executive agency to implement the laws that Congress passes. But it's not the first time that we've seen sluggish enforcement, and we are on it. We are working in a wide variety of ways. It's one reason why we conducted this FDA Modernization Act 2.0. We've got a plan, and we want you to be with us. But we wanted to tell you about what's going on and why this is so important. That's why I'm excited to have my colleague, Tamara Drake. She on the national radar screen. And Tammy, thank you for your incredible work on the FDA Modernization Act 2.0, your leadership on this issue. And uh, it's just been a pleasure to work with you to get this national policy enacted. And obviously we had hundreds of thousands of people who worked with us in ways small and large to get this done over the finish line, but our work is not done yet. Tammy. Thank you so much, Wayne. And it's been the honor of my life to work with this team and work with legislators like Senators Paul and Booker. And as they made the point, we overcame a huge hurdle 
by eliminating the mandate for animal testing and drug development with 2.0. And of course, we need to continue our work to ensure the policy is implemented by the FDA. And there are many reasons to be concerned over the continued use of animals in research and testing. But I know most of you here care about the animals. So I will focus on the true cost to animals. So can I have my first slide, please? So millions of animals are needlessly used in research and testing every year. There's a massive use of animals for drug development funded by the US government and of course the private sector pharma, including dogs, non-human primates and other animals. Likely the largest sector of animal testing like Wayne said in the beginning. Reports estimate that 114.8 billion is spent in the US annually on life sciences research with the federal government funding 31.5%. Of this amount, 56.4 billion, 49% is spent on preclinical research with government sources providing the majority of funding. Now to break it down with the latest numbers, which are out of date from the USDA and the US alone, and this does not include uh, mice and rats, which is they're used probably more than any animal in testing. But in the US in 2021, 13,000 cats, 45,000 dogs, mostly beagles, 72,000 non-human primates used in research and testing. That's a lot in the US alone. Next slide, please. So between 2000 to 2020, nearly 500,000 non-human primates were imported into the US for testing. Now, we have National Primate Research Centers, which are supposed to be the supply of non-human primates in the US, but that's not the case. Those mainly came from China. Next slide. There's Now there's a shortage of non-human primates because of an import ban uh, during COVID. Um, China provided most of the non-human primates to the U.S. Next slide. And this is pretty sad, and we're very concerned about this when we're trying to shift to a new paradigm. In 2021, the federal government invested $30 million to expand non-human primate breeding domestically and the shortage of primates has only become more acute. We're just using them faster than, than they can breed them. Next slide, please. And a lot of you have probably heard about this huge scandal. Thousands of smuggled, wild-caught, endangered non-human primates from Cambodia have been imported to the US you know, because they weren't getting them from China and criminal indictments were issued. And there were also subpoenas issued to U.S. companies, some of the largest U.S. companies like Charles River, which I know they received 1,000 endangered non-human primates and also Enotive, uh, another company in the U.S., a contract research organization. Next slide, please. Thanks. And if you look at the value, you look at all these animals and they're being ripped from the wild and we can't keep up with the breeding programs in the US, a recent human clinical trial of a J&J &J HIV AIDS vaccine failed because of lack of efficacy. They were tested in non-human primates. And the animal data showed 90% efficacy. 
completely failed in humans. This is consistent with the 30 plus year effort to develop an HIV AIDS vaccine. The animal data shows promise, but the vaccines absolutely do not work in humans. And relying on flawed animal models isn't sustainable. It's bad for patients, it's bad for animals, and it's bad for industry. Next slide. So I mentioned a note of received uh, subpoena regarding the endangered primates. They're the parent company to Invigo, and this everybody knows about this, but the Invigo beagle breeding facility was shut down by the Department of Justice in 2022. Nearly 5,000 beagles in that breeding facility and only one veterinarian. Imagine going to a hospital and you have 5,000 patients and one doctor. They didn't provide for basic needs of care. There were maggots in the food. The mothers of the babies couldn't reach the food. USDA, ins USDA inspectors found 300 dead puppies and 173 other beagles found decomposed to the point where they couldn't even do forensics on what happened to them. And fortunately, the remaining beagles were rescued. It was a huge undertaking by animal welfare groups, but we can't rescue our way out of this. I, I want to pass this on to my esteemed colleague, Zahar Nali. He's a senior scientific advisor to CHE and AWA, and he's going to discuss the impacts of continued animal testing on human health and the urgent need to transition to 21st century human relevant science. Thank you, Tammy, so much. And it's great to be here. If I can have my first, thank you, Ryan. Uh, I'd like to start by this rather sobering statement from one of the NIH centers. Therapeutic development, it says, is a costly, complex, and time-consuming process. The average length of time from target discovery to approval of a new drug is about 14 years. The failure rate during this process exceeds 95%. You know, remember that number, exceeds 95%. And the cost per successful drug can be $2 billion or more. That is cost that is passed on to you and me in form of uh, high prescription drug prices and elevated healthcare cost. And all of that is by and large the result of this obsessive reliance on artificial animal models that do not replicate the human biology. We cannot translate them from the laboratory to uh, clinical trials. So if I can have my next slide. So it is it is truly uh, indefensible to continue down that path, especially since we have these 21st century technologies. Some people call them alternatives, others call them uh, non-animal testing methods. Uh, people refer to them as new approach methodologies. Regardless of the nomenclature, we like our group today to just be familiar of some of these technologies we are talking about and their value, uh, just a bird's eye, eye view. Uh, these uh, are the results of conversions from multiple disciplines, uh, biophysics, electrical engineering, biochemistry, stem cell biology. Artificial intelligence is one powerful method, for example. Many of the drugs, as you know, are molecules, and molecules come in different sizes and shapes and forms. So these type of computer-assisted method methods and algorithms can help us determine the fate of that molecule as a drug uh, in absorption, in metabolism, in diffusion, in its modification. And this will provide us really great insights and get us closer to be able to predict the toxicology and the safety of these drugs. Another technology uh, that you'll hear a lot about is organ on a chip. We have a trailer for you on that, so I'm not delving into this too much. Organoids. Organoids are also miniature organs that we can now grow on Petri dishes, uh, believe it or not, and they replicate with great fidelity what's happening in humans. You hear about tissue engineering, 3D bioprinting, and the like. You know, all this to say that these 21st century uh, technologies are enabling us now to think about human health and 
biomedical research and drug discovery in progressive ways, in ways we were not able to think about in the past, away from these antiquated animal models, whether the application is in drug development, environmental health and safety testing, sustainability and ecology development, and certainly animal welfare. In fact, some of these technologies I mentioned here are spelled out and defined in the momentous FDA Modernization Act that was passed. And if we can if we can play the trailer now so that we can give an example of these organ chips, Ryan. This is amazing. This is an organ on a chip and it could help stop animal testing. Here's what's going on. More than 115 million animals are estimated to be tested on every year, which means exposing them to drugs and products to test effectiveness and safety for humans. But that might change. As of last December, the FDA no longer requires animal tests before human drug trials. So we're seeing some interesting new alternatives come out. The organ on a chip is a tiny 3D cell culture that reproduces the environment of any human organ. Researchers pump drugs through channels that can be lined with different kinds of human cells and fluids, simulating how that part of the body might work. And it's getting really good. Recently, this company called Emulate used a liver on a chip to screen 27 drugs that passed animal testing but actually caused liver toxicity in humans. And the device flagged 87% of the compounds that cause toxicity. So better than the animal test. So the idea here isn't just that we can reduce animal testing, it's also that we can improve tests for humans as well. If you like optimistic tech videos, follow for more. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Awesome, awesome trailer. Yes. If, if I can go to the next slide, Ryan, please. Yes, so as, as you saw, great potentials. And here I, I chronicled some of the advantages of these non-animal testing methods. Broadly speaking, they provide us with relevant disease modelings for complex pathologies. And as you saw in the trailer just now, one of the powerful applications is augmenting the accuracy of predicting drug toxicity in humans. 87% was mentioned as a number, and just as a reference, 45% uh, uh, are the uh, outcomes of the best uh, existing packages using uh, animal models. So from 45% to 87%, that's a huge, huge jump. One other point I'd like to highlight is that these type of methodologies are enabling us to prevent the ill-advised abandonment of perfectly safe and effective uh, drugs. Right now, this, the, the, the current design uh, entails that if a drug is not passing the animal tests, it's automatically abandoned, although it can be perfectly, uh, perfectly safe and efficacious in humans. So these type of methodology will stop that, that, that insane hemorrhage uh, of perfectly safe uh, and effective drugs. They can also save critical time during pandemics and emergencies and for vaccine development. Maybe as an example, you all remember the chloroquine saga. Uh, you know, so the scientists were, were quick at determining at the Wyss Institute uh, at Harvard in a manner of uh, just a few weeks using these type of technologies that actually chloro chlor chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are not effective in preventing COVID-19 infections in humans, unlike what uh, animal data uh, says and it turns out to be to be correct. Again, a very powerful application of these methodologies. These technologies can bolster discovery in rare, neglected, and life-altering diseases as well, uh, including dementia. Just as an example as well, we have right now more than 7,500 rare diseases, 95% of them. 95% do not have any FDA-approved drugs. Many of them are lethal. So the challenges has been that they have unreliable animal models, there's a high cost of these animals, and also small sample size of patients. So these type of technologies can not only modernize the process of drug development, but they can also democratize the process of drug development by reducing barriers of entry for sponsors to address these uh, challenges. And, and finally, of course, they can make personalized medicine a real tangible reality based on individualizing uh, things on eth ethnicity, uh, genetic makeup, uh, genetic predispositions, and so on and, and, and so forth. Again, these are some of the a powerful application of these technologies that we want our group just to understand why we are so much um, pushing towards these uh, these technologies. And as, as as Senator Booker just said, you know, it's 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 a uh, it's a uh, it's the uh, being on the right side of history, which I thought this was an incredible statement. So if you can go to the next slide, uh, Ryan, we don't have time to delve deeper into the economic benefit 
uh, of these uh, non-animal testing methods. I, I just maybe select one, the most recent uh, economic benefit uh, in analysis, competitive analysis done by the company Moderna, comparing uh, these uh, organ chips uh, that uh, we saw before uh, and uh, to, to non-human primates that uh, Tammy was mentioning, $325,000 for chips versus $5.25 million, the total cost of experiments, uh, a huge variance. Uh, the savings are not only in dollars, but also in time. Uh, if I recall, three uh, weeks to do the chip experiments versus three to four months to do the animal experiments that is not factoring in the years of breeding animals and the infrastructure that is that is needed. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip uh, many of that, but we can circle back if we still have time at the end of the Q&A. The point I'm trying to make and all of us are trying to make here is that there is an, an incalculable benefit uh, to shifting to these type of technologies uh, away from, from uh, outmoded animal testing, especially when we factor in the pandemics and disease prevention, environmental value and sustainability issues, national competitiveness and economic growth, fiscal waste reduction in academia and in uh, industry when it comes to research and development. So, you know, it's time to move away. And that's why we are fighting so much for the FDA Modernization Act 3.0 uh, to, to enforce the law. And I'll, I'll throw it back to, to uh, Wayne for additional analysis and discussion right now, but happy to take questions and we, we circle back if we have time on some of the economic uh, issues as well. Well, Dr. Nalpi, that, that was a, a great, a great uh, summary of what's at stake from a human health perspective. You know, our branding slogan at Animal Wellness Action and the Center for Humane Economy is helping animals helps us all. And I can't think of a more vivid example of that. I mean, Tammy just gave us an incredible rundown of, you know, these these testing laboratories and contract breeding facilities collaborating, conspiring to take endangered primates from the wild to smuggle them into the United States That's illegally incredible. to test to test them. And the Invigo uh, beagles so badly mistreated at, at a laboratory. And think about that. Not one animal, 10 animals, 100 millions of animals. Uh, this is just a, a colossally important animal welfare issue. And then you think that drugs as part of our public health strategy are central, right? I mean, sometimes we're not focusing enough on lifestyle and maintaining our health with proper diet and exercise and avoiding, avoiding behaviors that cause illness and disease in us. So we're looking for these fixes with drugs, whether it's palliatives or it's cures to terrible scourges and diseases. I mean, we don't have cures for cancer. We don't have cures for uh, Alzheimer's and dementia and so many problems that touch every one of our lives. I mean, we all have relatives and friends and coworkers who are afflicted by disease. And you see mm -hmm. that we've had this, this strategy of testing on animals that's been proved not to be right. predictive in 90 to 95% of the cases of the human circumstance, yet we keep doing it. Insanity. I mean, it's astonishing. It's astonishing that it took Animal Wellness Action in the Center for Humane Economy to initiate this legislation. And we were so fortunate to attract Senator Paul right. and Senator Booker, as well as Senator Mike Braun of Indiana, Senator Ben Ray Lujan of New Mexico, and many other lawmakers who stood up. And on the House side, Representative Byrne Buchanan, a Republican of Florida, former Representative Elaine Luria, Representative mm. Jan Schakowsky of Illinois, uh, Kurt Schrader, a, a Democrat from Oregon, Buddy Carter, a Republic from Georgia. There are so many heroes for us in the Congress who helped shepherd this legislation. You look back and think, oh my God, this was a fait accompli. This, this was so easy. Look at the arguments, they're overwhelming. Nobody gave us a chance when we started this bill. And it was because of people like you who supported us and enabled our experts like Tammy and Dr. Nolly to work on these issues and our staff who are grassroots organizers. And God, there were several people who were just so instrumental. My, my dear late friend, Skip Trimble, uh, we talked about this in the car driving through Texas and he was so concerned about animal testing. He said, I wanna help fund this. 
and he put he put hundreds of thousands of dollars into this campaign. And then Lori McGrath, uh, a dear friend of mine from California, uh, she invested to make so much of this possible and also to take this global that when the United States passed this, that South Korea began to pay attention and uh, the United Kingdom and the EU and nations all over the world because they think that we have the best system. And if we're going to do this, then they think, oh my God, we should be doing it too. So this was so much more than just a policy that affected the United States. It's a policy that is really reverberating across the globe. But as we said, while it's, there's so much good news here, of this very rapid legislative progress. I mean, so the average bill that I've worked on to pass in Congress takes seven years if a, if a bill passes at all. Most bills languish and die, but this happened within a, a little more than a year and a half. But we have a problem, and that problem is the intransigence of the FDA, steeped in this old model of animal testing not able to adapt to 21st century strategies grounded on human biology. And we have a plan and we want you tonight to please commit to being involved in our new effort. A central element of this new effort is the FDA Modernization Act 3.0. We started with Modernization Act and then we went to Modernization Act 2.0. That's what passed the Congress. And now we want 3.0, which compels FDA to act but also helps retool FDA with its existing resources to do its job more effectively and break out of this old mindset that we've got to use primates and beagles for testing when it just doesn't work reliably. So we want you to be involved in this effort. Uh, we send out alerts, we give you updates through email. We've got a dedicated uh, microsite called Modernized Testing uh, our main sites are animalwellnessaction.org and centerforhumaneeconomy.org. But we have rich resources. We're going to rebuild our coalition. We're going to get this legislation moving and we're going to get the FDA moving. You know, FDA is so out of alignment with what the pharmaceutical industry wants, the biotech industry, and so many others. We've seen hundreds of news stories from the science press and the popular press about what the FDA Modernization Act 2.0 means in terms of a paradigmatic change in how we're screening drugs and delivering human health and safety. The FDA has just been stuck in the mud on this issue and we're not going to allow it to occur. You know, rarely do you get change without tension and without obstinacy, and you cannot have change without advocacy and activism. And that's why groups like ours exist at AWA and CHE to organize people of conscience to exert their collective power to change institutions, whether it's FDA or some other federal agency or it's a sector of the economy. That's exactly what we're doing. So now is not the time to celebrate only. Let's celebrate the gains we've made that are extraordinary, but let's also get to the task of achieving our greatest goal which is dramatically reducing and eventually eliminating the use of animals in drug screening and replacing them with these 21st century technologies that Dr. Nali articulated um, are, are just light years ahead of the animal testing model. So Joseph, I want to just again, reiterate our thanks to, to all of our colleagues. And I was really touched to have Senator Paul and Senator Booker join us. Uh, uh, with a recorded message that they both uh, taped today. And I know we want to take a couple of questions if we've got some time. Thank you, Wayne. I appreciate that. Uh, Tammy, let's start with one for you. Uh, we've talked a lot about what's happening maybe on the regulatory side, the science side. What is happening inside Big Pharma? Big Pharma is supportive of this technology and, you know, pharmaceutical companies aren't usually, you know, altruistic and they're not nonprofits. They, they're in the business for, for profit, right? And they see the promise of using these technologies. Sanofi, for one, said they're going to reduce their animal testing by 50% by 2030. Merck 
claims they're going to be the first to stop using animal testing. And Merck is working with this Israeli company called Curus, who has an artificial intelligence combined with like organ chips. Um, and they've, they're collaborating. Most pharmaceutical companies are making deals with artificial intelligence companies. It's AstraZeneca, Novartis, Bayer, Biogen, Galapagos, GSK, Janssen, Pfizer, Merck, Roche, Takeda, and others have all published papers, and this is only up until 2020, on their use of these different technologies, um, a lot of them microphysiological systems, because they see the value. If they can bring a drug to market and half the time and reduce their costs fivefold, they're going to do it. And it's going to help all of us patients. So, you know, biotech, the people creating these models are all on board, but pharma is too. And we didn't get any pushback from pharma when we were, you know, working on getting 2.0 through. So it, it's very positive. Thank you, Tammy. Just out of curiosity, how much, one of our viewers asked, how much does one of these organs on a chip cost? Depends, and Zahair can probably answer this based on the liver chip study. Uh, yes, dif different companies sell them for different uh, value or 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 price. Uh, just uh, just ball just ballpark. Uh, yeah, like they if I can wanted to go by five hundred dollars to three thousand dollars. So I mean, there there's a there's a differential here, but. Uh, a lot of these companies are actually entering into agreements and collaborations where they can provide you some of these chips for, for free to accelerate the process. So that's an advantage that many people should, uh, should, should uh, consider as well. Thank you. Next question is for you, Wayne. Where is the Biden administration in all of this? The FDA is that White House's agency. Why aren't they doing more or are they? Well, I'm so I'm so glad. Thank you. So glad for that question. Thank you for asking it. I'm deeply disappointed in the Biden administration. I've been knocking on the door at the White House uh, saying, get your FDA cracking on this issue. This is a constitutional responsibility. We have a, a separation of powers. Um, the different uh, branches of government uh, have responsibilities and relationships. The Congress enacts the law the executive agencies implement the law. The Congress passed the FDA Modernization Act 2.0. The FDA is supposed to be implementing it. We had a major change in the law, eliminated the need or the requirement for animal testing. The FDA's regulations stipulate that animals still need to be used. They've got to change the regulations. And the Biden administration, the folks at the White House should be calling over to the commissioner, Robert Califf at the FDA and saying, What's going on? Why has it been 13 months? Why don't we have a rewrite in the works of the regulations so we can move toward 21st century science? You can talk about a moonshot for cancer. You know, the pre President Biden has talked about that before. He's, he's talked a lot about health issues during his career uh, as president, vice president, senator. Well, this is how you help advance cures is by unsticking this process and getting drugs develop that work because you're using reliable methods to screen them and you're doing it at an affordable level so that the American public can access it. I mean, we're spending what, 18% of GDP on healthcare related issues. I mean, double any country in the world. And this is not working. This is absolutely not working. I mean, advances in life expectancy, you know, relate to this to a degree, but it's so much about our our lifestyles. We can be doing a lot better. And I, I'm just really upset that the administration is not acting. And you better believe I'll be knocking on that door over the next days, weeks, months. And I don't care if it's Democrat or Republican, we're gonna call them out when they're not doing the right thing. And when people do do the right thing, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, we're gonna celebrate that. Animal welfare, is a nonpartisan issue. It is a universal value. 
Human health is a nonpartisan issue. It is a universal value. We have the intersection of these issues with this subject matter that we've talked about tonight. We can do better. We're providing one key solution. It's not everything, but my God, it's a mightily important solution. And we just have to do better. And FDA has got to do better. Thanks, Wayne. And I think this question touches on that. I know with Animal Wellness Action, much of our work focuses on the zoonotic potential of diseases, the spillover. Uh, cockfighting, we address that there. Mink uh, uh, farming, we address that there as well. Uh, one of our viewers is concerned that the importation of these primates for this medical use may itself be a zoonotic risk. What say you? It is. It is. And the Certainly. CDC has re reported on it. Deadly pathogens came in with these animals. There was a truckload of, I believe it was long-tailed macaques coming from Mauritius. And they were traveling through that landed, I forget what airport, traveling through Pennsylvania. They crashed. A hundred monkeys were scattered all over the place because of fear of disease, because these animals had not been quarantined. They were shooting them out of the trees. One woman who had, you know, she saw the crash and tried to help. The crates were all broken. She had to really go in and get a bunch of testing, but it's shown in some of those animals that actually made it into testing facilities they were sick. There's all kinds of, these are wild animals. We have to worry about that. It's a huge right. risk. You know, let me just Absolutely. let me just say for a moment that, you know, think about this. Think about animals shot in the wild and then surviving that process to then be jammed in a cage or a crate and shipped around the world, you know, separated from your family members, uh, denied the most elemental uh, elements of normal behavior, everything you've known in your life in the wild, just ripped out of there and put on some passage to the United States, then put in a truck with others, crammed in there, all of them, you know, exchanging air together when all diseases in that environment, highly stressed, then to end up in a lab where you're further tormented I mean, these animals have lives that matter to them. These are primates. They share so many characteristics that we can relate to. They certainly feel pain just like we do. They're built of the same nerve endings and, and the capacity to have these sensibilities. They have consciousness. They mm -hmm. feel fear and pain. I mean, we don't think about this. Those of you who are on this call do think about it, and I appreciate you so much for it. But so many people don't think about these dramas playing out. One animal going through a drama that is a life and death circumstance for this creature. And then to think of putting the animals through that for something that is such a broken system that we know science and experience teach us that this is not working, yet we persist. It's this laboratory animal industrial complex. And we really can do so much better. And you know, the agencies are captured by these industries so often and they're rooted in the methods that they learned in the 1950s or 60s or 70s. They've got to make this transition. Think about all the incredible changes that we're seeing in our lifetimes in terms of computing and AI. We've got to adapt, and scientists should be at the forefront of that, not relying on the things that they, they learned 30 years ago, but learning about things now and looking ahead in the future. So I just grieve for these animals, and I also just am so pained at this colossal loss of, of human invention, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm pained by the waste of billions of dollars. And I'm pained by the idea that, you know, all of us had family members who have passed away from diseases that perhaps could have been treated better, uh, extending lives, delivering better quality of life. But the system is broken and uh, we just have to do better. 
Very good. So here, did you want to add anything to that before we wrap up? Yes, to, to, uh, just add uh, very briefly, just give statistics from the CDC and the caller, the guest is, is spot on uh, asking that question about zoonatic transmission. Three out of four, I mean, listen to that number, three out of four, according to the CDC, of novel uh, pandemics and infections originate in uh, what they call zoonatic transmission, meaning transmission from animals to humans. 75% of novel outbreaks uh, originate from uh, zoonatic transmission in factory farming, uncapped animal, etc. Now, so the, so the risk of uh, importing animals or breeding animals or having factory farm animals uh, is it's it's insane when you when you do the risk analysis of these kind of things. Again, remember the the COVID nineteen pandemic and data from the CDC. Seventy five percent of novel of new pandemics of viruses and pathogens that we haven't seen before are coming from zoonotic transmission. Scary. To to the point that was discussed. All right. Very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, we're getting to the top of the hour, so I, I just want to wrap up with a couple of notes. If you did not have your question answered, and there were a couple that didn't get answered, I invite you to email me. I'll make sure that they do get answered. Joseph at animalwellnessaction.org. Uh, we would uh, love to answer those, and certainly we're grateful for your being here uh, to, to present those questions. We'll send out the email tomorrow. You'll have the link. We'll have some other assets in it that we've referred to links to various sites, modernizedtesting.org. It's our microsite on this issue. Check that out as well. We'll also include a link to a video of a floor speech Rand Paul gave in defense of FDA modernization. We'll also keep you up to speed when we have our next Claudia Miller Ignite series on animal welfare event. This is a series of 12. This is event number seven. Uh, we have five more to go and we hope you will you will join that. Wayne, is my math right? Wayne knows that I'm seven, five. Is that 12? All right, good, good, excellent. All right, so thank you, everyone. On behalf of Wayne, Tammy, Zahir, really appreciate you. We bid you good night, and thanks for being now on the Animal Wellness Action Team. Good night.